You know, I got fired for having a side hustle 15, 16 years ago. Now it's gone the other way. Now if you don't have that side hustle going on, it's like you're not a complete person. Both of those are a bit wrong. So you get fired? Yes. How are you making money? It was such a shock to my system. You feel shock, you feel a bit embarrassed, you have fear. How am I gonna pay my rent? I'm gonna feed myself. All these things come crushing in really quickly. And that is the question. How do you become the CEO of one of the biggest agencies, president of one of the most respected trade bodies in the industry? For the company to succeed, there's three things that you need to think about. The first one is all about talent, all about people. We need to be the choice of the best talent in our market. So you've got to have a really clear proposition that you're offering. You've got to stand for something. You have a point of view. You've got to have a culture, you know, a belief system. That gives you a chance to get the best people in. But once you get the best talent, you've then got to create an environment that they want to stay in. The real focus for us as a business was to make more famous work. And that was actually exactly the time that we launched Compare the Market or Compare the Meerkat. The cost of your search term of Compare Car Insurance costs you a lot. So that's like five pounds. Meerkat was, no one was searching for Meerkat, so that was like five p. <laughs> and no one was searching for it then. Then Compare the Market became the after McDonald's Happy Meals the biggest toy distributor in the whole of the UK. Starting his story in Salford, he started his life in the north of our island nation. From early, his parents instilling his belief in learning and education. Hi, I'm Julian Douglas, and this is how I became VCCP International Chief Exec and IPA President. Starting his story in Salford, he started his life in the north of our island nation from early his parents instilling his belief in learning and education. For his vision within the industry, he was successfully elected, bringing forth a real mission to spotlight the work and efforts that are truly effective. His initiatives within the industry continue to engage and affect change, with a mission to bring 10 times effects within his presidential campaign. So if you didn't know him much before, you should know him 10 times more today. Welcoming Julian Douglas, CEO and Vice Chairman of VCCP International and President of the IPA. Very good. Love that. Nice welcome, one. Welcome. There we go. That's your story in a poem. Love that. Don't have many of those. <laughs> so Great. We're, we're going to unpack your story, which yes. is quite a story. Yeah. I'm amazed yes. that you sleep. Maybe you don't because yeah, you don't sleep enough. do get involved in a lot of things and doing a lot of great work in the industry. So you are as I said, chief exec of VCCP. And VCCP is well known for Compare the Market. Yes. Or Compare the Meerkat. And uh, and the O2. O2 priority Absolutely. was birthed from, from VCCP, which you were heavily involved in and brought in for, yes. um, along with many other campaigns you've been involved with for Audi, Lynx, Domino's, Nationwide, and Shell. Quite a career. And uh, a bit of context as, as VCCP as well. This is a, a big company in terms of billings, the third biggest agency in the UK. That's right. At 361 million. Must be proud of, of uh, everything you've, you've achieved and the campaigns you've been part of. Yes, I would definitely say it's important to take pride in the work you do and your achievements. But equally, you know, VCCP, we're just at the start, really, especially on the international front. So... Um, whilst it is important to take stock, it's more about what comes next. Okay, well, we will definitely get into that. And just to finish off your intro, it takes a while because you, you've done a lot of things. <laughs> also founder of Lucky Voice. Not many uh, CEOs are founders of a karaoke bar across the country. Well, I'm an avid karaoke fan. And <laughs> I think it's a very, very useful experience to set up a business mm. of any kind. I mean, personally, I... Uh, you know, particularly enjoyed that it was in karaoke. I think it's a really good thing to do anyway. I'm sure you're asked this question a lot. It must be done. Everybody's wondering, what is your karaoke song? It changes over time. It changes over time. But I'd say at the moment, Grandma's Hands, Bill Withers is probably my go-to mm -hmm. at the moment. Nice. Fantastic choice. Uh, you also have an exec MBA, uh, bachelor's and master's degree from Oxford. You are a member of the UK Client Council for Meta, previously known as Facebook, and, and also chair of the advisory board for BRIM, Black Representation in Marketing, 
We're not done yet. Still going. <laughs> uh, not only that, you're president of the IPA, the Institute of Practitioner Advertisers. And uh, to shake things up with your 10x plan, we'll get into that. And that is a good introduction of, of the many things you're involved with. <laughs> And that is the question. How do you become the CEO of one of the biggest agencies? How do you start your own company? How do you become president of one of the most respected trade bodies in the industry? That's what we're going to answer. And to do that, we're taking it back. So to take it back to the okay. earliest beginnings, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? So I, gr I was born in Essex, actually, so just down the road. Um, but I'm very much a northerner because I was before the age of one, my parents moved up to Salford, where I grew up as a kid, and then moved down to Timpley in Cheshire. And yeah, I guess I had a really, I was lucky enough to have a really varied upbringing. My dad's Jamaican, my mum's Irish. I grew up in Salford. That's lots of different influences coming in, and brother, elder brother and elder sister as well. So yeah, it's a very lively time, lots of different influences to draw from different perspectives mm. a big uh, importance was put on education from an early age um, which I think you'll find with many people whose parents are immigrants there's a need to just study and work hard um, but you know growing up up, up north was was you know a, a real uh, strong sense of community what did that teach you that in terms of the not only your the influence of the maybe Jamaican culture and, and Irish culture, but the sense of community in, in where you were as well? Well, I think, I mean, I think every, all of us are products of our environment and products of our upbringing. And, you know, my, I was lucky that mine was a very happy one. And I think growing up in that, growing up in a, in a household, sitting at a dinner table where I've got different cultures around me, as, as, it's a real blessing for, for me. I mean, there, there are challenges that can come with it too, but for me, I've always... I always tend to look on the positive, on the glass half full. So throughout, you know, in my immediate dinner table, I'm getting lots of different influences and perspectives, whether it's from food to music to the reference points that you look to, Any from examples? the extended family that you go to. It just means you've got two whole worlds to draw from, plus the one that you're in. You know, and it's, it's, it's at different stages of my life I've drawn on those backgrounds and influences different degrees I suppose I think especially for me as a kid I really and actually when I came to London I, I mostly identify with being a northerner with being a Mancunian actually it's my touchstone mm. um you know out of a hu huge background in music I'd say from my dad my dad was a musician when he was younger mm. and so music's always been really central to our family life and and I'd say on my Irish side it's just as strong an influence on me I mean, I've been to Ireland way more times than I've been to Jamaica, obviously. It's, you know, it's just across the, you can get across in no time. But I think, but both of those had huge impacts on me. Most of all, I think an appreciation of the richness of diversity that's out there in this country. It's one of the benefits of being in the UK. You've got so many different influences that you can draw upon. Mm. Mm. So, so school goes well. You get straight A's at Manchester Grammar School. Yes, well, my folks, my folks worked extremely hard to offer me a good education. You know, so I, I was lucky enough to get a great education. I think the, the deal was they, they saw that I was a pretty bright kid, I guess, when I was at primary school. How did they know? Well, again, I, I can't emphasize how much education is important in our, in our family, and that's often the case for for kids of immigrants because you come over with nothing and, and for everybody always wants the best for the next generation. Same for me and my own daughter. And education is the most, the quickest way to, to give yourself the best chance, especially when you have extra challenges to get over um, than, than, than everybody else. Do you remember what your parents would say to you? In I mean, the, the line from my dad would always be, you've got to work at least twice as hard as everybody else. You know, you are starting further back, so you're going to have to work harder to get ahead. That was, that's always how it was. And I guess... Do you remember what you thought about that I'd, at the time? Well, nobody really wants to get told they've got to work twice as hard, really, do they? But <laughs> I, I was, I benefited by being the youngest. Mm. So I had an elder brother and elder sister who were like, it's tough, but you know what, he's right. So I think that made my path a lot easier. 
I see. Because I, I could hear it from them as well. And so, I mean, I had a lot of fun at school. So I did a lot of sport. I was pretty naughty, but I, I also put the shift in where I had mm. to do it. And I think especially with the opportunities I, I was afforded and the direction I was given by my parents and then the support of my brother and sister tell me it's the right thing to do and, you know, to stay on track, stay on target. It, it, you know, it, that, that was a springboard for me to be able to go to uni, which in turn got me into a career that I've, I've really enjoyed. When did your love of like advertising and media begin? I don't know. It's, I can remember back to being a, you know, a proper little kid and, and I'd always knew the jingles on, ch- on ads, you know. I, I, there was lots of great advertising in the 80s, right? So I was born mid-70s, mm. 76. So by the time I was about 10, that was an era of some wonderful, wonderful advertising anyway that everybody can remember to this day. Um, so I, I, I grew up with that around me and I guess I took notice of it. And I'm, I hadn't really thought about it as a job until right at the end, right at the end of secondary school, they had like a careers night, and all the different things you could do. Mm-hmm. And my dad was pushing me towards engineering and, you know, proper jobs. And there was this one guy from an advertising agency or a design agency or something like that. And it just, it just seemed, uh, uh, I, I was quite drawn to it. Mm. I guess I wasn't thinking too hard about what job I wanted to do back then. But I guess I'd, I'd always had that feeling of finding that interesting. Yeah. And I guess it wasn't until I went to uni and started to get near the end of uni, you start thinking, well, what am I going to actually do here? You know, so, um, so that's when it started to come into my mind. And in my final year at university, I got a brilliant job to top up my grant. I used to get a grant in those days. Mm-hmm. And I got a brilliant job at the career service at university where I used mm-hmm. to print the booklet that went out to all the graduates every week. So I saw, I used to operate a big old printing press with big, all the paper and big machines and clear the paper jams and refill the ink and all that sort of stuff. So I saw every single job on the milk round that went through university. Mm. And I was just, I, I applied to loads of them, loads of them, not all just advertising. Advertising was what I w- wanted to do. And this was Oxford? Yeah. How was it getting into Oxford? So it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of hard work, but I went to a school that prepared you well. So I had about the best chance you could get. And yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't, I sort of hoped I'd go, but I, it wasn't my life's mission. I think my folks were really keen for me to go. And yeah, I just got my head down, did the extra study, took the papers. I was so excited when I got an interview. When I got an interview to Oxford, I was like, wow. Cause I didn't, you sort of don't dare think you're going to go. Mm. And so I went down for the couple of days interview and I was so excited. I've always loved, I've always loved that. Uh, I think access is so important getting into places that I don't expect to or and that's something I've, I've really kept in my career and a lot of the initiatives that I've done, even advertising on lots, all about access. It's about seeing how things work, mm-hmm. seeing behind the curtain. So when I got two and a half, had two or three days down there in Oxford to, to do your interviews, I loved that. I, I then wanted it so much more because I started to see what was there. In those days, it was great as well because once you pass the once you pass the exams and the interviews, your offer was too easy at A level, which took all the pressure off. So that was oh an nice. absolute treat. Yeah. So did you get too easy at A level? Well, once the pressure's off, you then you know you you tend to waste them anyway. So yeah. <laughs> so that was good, but um, it was quite a culture shock though going down to Oxford. I think the first year I found it very difficult. Why? Just the the shift transitioning down there, living on the student student grant, which wasn't much. So I think the first year I didn't really commit to it. And then in my second and third year, thank God, I got my head around it and absolutely loved it. And uh, it was, it was a, you know, I'm still very involved in my college to this day. What did you gain from your overall time at, at, at the university? Oh, loads. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it's steeped in tradition. So you, you, it, it, you, you could start to understand how parts of the structure of our, you know, government society is put together because it's all around you. You're yeah. just, you know, you're surrounded by it. I think it, it, was, it was quite humbling because you might go from being one of the brightest kids at your school, then you go there and you're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, there's some proper brain boxes here. But um, it also undoubtedly gives you confidence mm. to go, 
you know, well, if I can do this and I can, I can take anything on. By the time I got into third year, all I wanted to do was get to London. I was just dying to come down to London to get stuck in, get working. Mm. So you have a great time at Oxford. You're karate yes. club captain. Yes. And I love that. I, I, my dad did karate. Um, so I started at a young age doing karate and I, I got my black belt at 15. Mm. And I didn't really like it that much, to be honest. It was hard. It's hard. It's not, not massively fun as a teenager. But when I got to uni, I didn't do it in the first year. And then in the second year, I went along and then I loved it because I actually needed, I needed the discipline and structure that the martial arts give you. It's everything. You just left your own device uh, uh, at Oxford. And I, and I got really into it. I love the competitive element. I love Kumite. I love the sparring. I love that feeling of going one oh one against you know, head to head against someone. And when you win or lose, it's just so clear. You know, you're very respectful when you lose, you're like fair play, you're just better than me. I, I, I really got into it a big way. So So now it's time to go out into the big bad world yes. and fight your way through your career. <laughs> Where does it begin? Yes, well I so I applied to loads of different jobs, loads of different sectors, but it boiled down to two. I've got two job offers. One was to trade derivatives um, in the city. One was to start on a grad scheme in advertising at WCRS. Mm. And it was quite hard to make the choice between the two, right? Why? Because I wanted to do the advertising, but my dad was like, you know, my family were like, you got a chance to make loads of money, you know, in the city. And there was an advert that was out at the time that was quite instrumental. It was an advert for Audi mm. that BBH did. Frank Budgen shot it called Number One, and it was a guy doing a test drive in an Audi. I don't know if you know it. And it's like money, nothing to be ashamed of. Places you go, people you see, car you drive. And he's like loads of money okay. guy, and he like brings it back to the Audi dealership and throws the keys and goes, no, nah, not my style. And I was like, I love that ad so much. When he used to come out and make all my flat makes be quiet. He couldn't <laughs> rewind in them days. And I was, I was just like, that's the best bit of film I'd ever seen. Mm. And so I was like, I want, I want to make that ad. I don't want to be... The guy in the ad, I want to make that ad. But as it was, I did, on the same day, I did work shadowing in the morning at the trading company in the afternoon at WCRS. Wow, so you got a clear contrast. Yeah, oh, my God, contrast. that absolutely nailed it. Because mm. in the morning, it was, I mean, I did love the the vibe on the trading floor, actually. And I was giving you grief as you're walking around and calling you me. He likes that. Yeah, it was, it was like proper banter. You know, they're all calling me Colly Moore, who was a big footballer at the time. Right. As I was walking around. And then I, but you know, the, 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 the young lad who was taking me round, he, he was like, you know, I start at work at six every day. I don't see the sunlight. Mm. Then I went to, it was hardcore. I mean, it, it was quite a buzz, but it was hardcore. Mm. And I went to the ad agency in the afternoon. <laughs> it was just joyous. It was just like, you know, people larking about. It was, it was just night and day. I was so, like, I'm definitely doing that. So that was decided. How did you have that conversation with your parents? Oh, to be honest, my, my parents... By the time I got to uni, they were like, we've done our bit. Mm. Up to you now. So they, they, they'd more than, more than done their part. They were like, you know, follow your bliss, really, which I think is a really important thing. I think, you know, to, to, to find out what you want to do it is important to go with something that you're into. I don't buy the whole thing of do a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life, because I'll come on to that. Mm. I don't think that's quite true, but I think it is important to follow something that you've got a, at least a deep interest in, if if not a real passion for. Mm, yeah, that really helps. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's what took me to WCRS. So WCRS now engine. That's right. Uh, tell us about your experience. You're starting off. Oh, it's amazing! It's amazing. So I joined, I joined WCRS. Stephen Woodford, who I know you've had on here, mm -hmm. he was the MD. I got in there. It was a really strong agency. Had just moved to Golden Square in the middle of Soho. It's an epicenter of advertising in London. And it was doing amazing work for Orange, the mobile phone brand that used to exist. It used mm -hmm. to do beautiful, beautiful work. The future's bright, the future's orange. Yeah, yeah. Stephen took um, talk to us about that. There you yeah. go. So um, it was doing BMW. It was doing, mm. it was doing really great work. It was fun. It had a bar in it. So you'd basically get paid and then you'd have your lunch in there 
and that would come straight out of your salary. And then you have your drinks in there in the evening, that would come straight out of your salary. So at the end of the month, you wouldn't have much left. <laughs> you basically <laughs> spent it all in the bar. But it was so lively. It was so much fun. I had an absolute riot. Yeah. And I was just so excited. I was living in London, working advertising. It's in Golden Square. So just life around you. And, and making amazing stuff that you could then see on the telly at night or on posters. It was, and you're like affecting your world. It, and it was, it, was, it was one of the most fun agencies in town back then. WCRS. So I've got very, very fond memories of it. Charles Valance and Rini Carruthers, who were the VNC of VCCP, were both at WCRS at that time. Okay. So, you know, R- Rooney was creative director and Charles was head of planning. So that ended up, you know, helping me. That's why they hired me later on in my career. I see. So they so knew the, me as the, the. Your first job influenced, yes, you know, yes. getting involved in the company you would later become CEO. If you have goals and ambitions within your personal life, career, or business, and would like to overcome the challenges that you face, inspire people, and get to your goals faster, then a coach might be the right solution for you. Go to weunify.co.uk forward slash coach. Now back to the show. Absolutely. Which is a really key, it's a really key thing to note that, you know, the, the context that you make at every step in your journey, in your career, you know, be mindful of them because they you will be remembered and that can, that can be good or bad depending on how you carry yourself. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very important lesson for everyone who's listening as well. Mm. You know, be aware, be wary mm. of how you treat people and exactly, how, exactly. how you present yourself because that may come people, back. People, later people, on. Are got, people are going to remember whether it's good or bad. But mm. um, man, yeah, WCRS, I just had such a great time there. Although, it, you know, there was still had its own moments. It was... I was fresh to London. I didn't know anybody in the industry at the time when I came down. So I had no contacts. I had some family who lived on the outskirts of London on my dad's side, but I didn't really see them much. And I didn't know anybody in advertising. I just came down on a flyer and, and thought I fancy doing this. Mm. So oh, I think it was, move. Yeah, it's well, I think it's, move. it's really important. I mean, what I did at the time where I didn't know much again, it's just a sponge. I think it's, it's asked so many questions. Questions, questions, questions. I, I was so social. I never had lunch alone, always chatting to people, just being whatever, whatever the thing was, working late, doing softball in the, with the, you know, the agency team, football, anything. I'd just be yes, yes, yes. I just, I just wanted to learn and just soak up as much as I possibly could. Mm-hmm. And I think having that, you know, um, that is true of any industry, but, uh, your new entrants are are the lifeblood of of an agency. You know, we're we're a, t- we're a people business, we're a talent business, yeah. and getting new people in. I say this to the new joiners at VCCP now. They're disproportionately important when you come in because you're bringing in a whole lot of youthfulness, mm. energy, mm. perspectives that people who've been there for a while don't have anymore. Mm. You're a massive role to play. I mm. guess I I was like a bit of a live wire when I got into. WCRS. It wasn't all. It wasn't all good, but um, yeah, I certainly made an impression. Tell us about in your early career. You you have a pay review. Yes. How does that go? Yes, I I, I joined. I joined in September ninety seven, um, and in those days the pay wasn't very good. I mean, there's an argument it's not very good now. What were you, do you know? What you were getting paid? I, yeah, then? I, I earned fourteen thousand pounds a year. A, a, a year, and the job in the city was double that. Mm, so I earned off. 14 grand and it was a thousand pound bonus at Christmas, which I went to Tower Records in Piccadilly and bought a, a PlayStation. Uh, nice. I can still remember. But And half of that 14,000 was going on food and uh, Well, most of it, yeah, because yeah. I remember the first month when I got my salary through, it was meant to be 890 pounds after tax and all I got was 400 quid because the rest had gone behind the bar. <laughs> and, and I set the record for the for the grad's bar tab, which I which I was quite proud of, but then until I had to pay my rent. Um, but yeah, I went in for my pay review at the end of that first year with Paul Lawson, who was the MD. No, he, he was uh, head of account management at the time. Mm. And Paul, he was a very, very funny man. And also clearly a bit because <laughs> I went in for my pay review and he goes, right, Dougie, based, based, on, based on the last, he goes, you've earned 40,000 pounds. And I was like, yes. And he goes, and there's a thousand pound Christmas bonus. And I was like, yes. I think it's based on your performance over the past 12 months. You owe us the grand. Ouch. Oh. And I was like, ouch. my jaw hit the deck. And I was like, what? 
And I literally had to argue why I shouldn't have to pay back <laughs> thousand pounds Apart to Lawson. Apart from the fact you'd already bought a PlayStation. I, I know, <laughs> I know. He just totally had me on toast. So yeah, it was it was a quite a learning moment that actually. And did with you Lawson. keep your grand? I I did, and it actually, it, you know what? He did me a favour in a way because all my arguments of of why I should why I shouldn't give it back were just so weak, and and I sort of left, and it, it schooled me. So when I all the other grads got pay rises, apart from me. Oh, All why? of whom I'm still in touch with today. Yeah. So when I went in for my next one with him, I knew my numbers inside out. Mm. My argument the second time was so much more commercial. I was like, right, I work on this account. The revenue's this much. I'm responsible for this percent of it. This media spend, I'm responsible for this much. Add it all up. That isn't commensurate with you paying me £14,000. And he was like, right, you've, you've stepped it up. Nice one. Okay. So I got my pay rise. And you got your pay rise. I got my pay rise. Then I buggered off and went to PBH. <laughs> but, um, yeah, what was, was your pay uh, rise? What did you go up to? <laughs> it went up to about 15 or 16, I think. It, it, was, it wasn't a lot. but um, It's the lesson in it. That's yeah. the it, it, was, it was a very good lesson to learn after year one. Mm. But I mean, I think he was just gutted. I was having so much fun. So you go to BBH, a yes. massive agency, yes. well-respected, spent four years there. You get yes. up to... Um, Account director. Yes. PBH then was probably the best agency on the planet. I mean, it was doing remarkably good work. What kind of work were so you working on? I, I joined to work on Levi's. And they that's when Levi's was cool. And they'd just... one jeans? They'd just done Flat Eric, which oh, had wow. won every possible award going. <laughs> um, so I was basically joining... I was joining, like, the best team, the best agency. It was amazing. This is just... a it was in uh, December 99, I went to BBH. And it was very different to WCRS. They took it very seriously at BBH. Okay, the fun in, and games in, had reduced a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I still had quite a good laugh at BBH. But it was just a hit factory. We just did, everything was outstanding. We did, it was Levi's Engineered Jeans. We did Frank Budgeon Twisted. That got a, oh, yeah. a black pencil, gold at can. Did Freedom to Move, where they run through the walls and up the trees. Uh, we're smashing out amazing work. Bernardo's with uh, Alex and Adrian. That got you know IPA effectiveness Grand Prix. Worked on Lynx. Worked on Audi. It was just so you, amazing at BBH so at that time. From seeing that Audi ad originally yes. going, I would love to get into the yes. industry. What was the moment like where you're like, that was, I'm working honestly, on it? Honestly, that yeah. was... That was like a proper life goal to make some Audi ads. And we did some really, really good ones for the TT. Um, it was fantastic. It was, it, was so, it was so different to WCRS. It was so committed to the quality and the craft and the primacy of the idea at BBH at that time. And the competitiveness between the creative teams was so high. Because, you know, you had Sir John Hegg was was you know it's doing the business at that time you've got brilliant teams trying to outdo each other um really strong planning department it was it was a brilliant place to learn your trade yeah what, what would you say were the critical factors to just being a hit factory as you said i what bbh did so well back then is it had managed to it's got its 10 founding principles on the wall and one of them's processes that liberate creativity and mm. what amazed me was They'd thought about the intentionality, thinking about all the things that could get in the way of coming up with a good idea and then selling a good idea. Mm. And they'd stripped them all away. So it's amazing. So all, loads of, I mean, WCRS was like a sixth form college, right? It was just like an absolute laugh. It was brilliant. BBH was like a well-oiled machine. It was almost mm. Germanic in its efficiency. But printers work at BBH. You know, <laughs> things, you, anything that gets in the way is removed. Mm. I mean, if anything, it perhaps lacked a little on the fun side in the building, but, you know, we certainly had fun when we went out. Yeah. And that's really where Lucky Voice was, was born, was BBH. Um, Tell us about that. What, so, how did it originate? So um, when I was working on Audi by this stage, and the planner, Johnny Shaw, um, and I got on particularly well, and he'd spent some time in Japan um, after he finished university himself, so he loved karaoke. And he spoke Japanese, which was very important because the only private room karaoke bar in Soho at the time on Frith Street karaoke box back then had some really old 1980s Japanese technology. It was a sushi bar and upstairs it had some of these 
little old units. And that predominantly had Japanese songs. And then they'd have like some Frank Sinatra and some Elvis. Mm. And we used to go there with people from the office. And, you know, just cans of Sapporo and a dripping air conditioning unit. It was really basic. Mm. Uh, but it was great fun because it's a little room, you know. You could smoke in the rooms in them days. Imagine that. It's grim. Uh, but you'd have so much fun. And then after a bit, we started taking... You go for work birthday events, then we'd start taking clients there. And we're having a better night, you know. You could have a junior client could have his arms round Gwyn Jones, the chief exec's shoulder, singing Don't Look Back in Anger, which you would have a better night than you would if you all went for dinner. Yeah, mm. you built some meaning. Uh, you know, it was and people just loved it and it just became the thing. So Johnny and I were it was many years in the making, but we were like, if we did this well, if we did this really well, there's a business here. Yeah, and ultimately we got funding when we moved together to Grey, got funding and opened Lucky Voice, and that was about what seventeen years ago now, and it's still going. There's eight of them. There's one in Dubai, so the model works for sure. Look at that, amazing. Um, yeah. So, because you, you you went to Grey after BBH, right? yes, and that's yeah. when the company Lucky Voice started. Yes, we did four years at BBH, or I did four years at BBH. Um, Went to Grey to try and turn the oil tanker around there. That was a that was a heck of a what a was happening period. when you joined. So they were trying to modernise and become far more contemporary and sort of throw off the perception that they're a big old network agency. And who are Grey for people who don't? So know? So Grey is a big. It's one of the biggest agency networks in the world. WPP owned them. Um, New York born agency. You know, it must be about 80 years ago. And they, they handle big accounts, Procter & Gamble's, GSK, big. At the time, it would be seen quite boring work. So it, it wasn't, you know, a hot shop like BBH or WCRS. It was very steady. And they were trying to take, take up the quality of their output by a couple of notches. So they mm -hmm. got in a maverick chief exec. He made drastic changes. He got rid of lots of people and brought in a, bunch of us and it catastrophically failed but it was bloody hell it was fun <laughs> it was Why a did it great fail? Year, year because um the the head guy gary lace who is is very infamous uh character in this industry he he was he was it was rock and roll um but it it was it was just bedlam. any stories gray was pretty wild at that time they they took out all five meeting rooms and replaced it on the ground floor and replaced it with the longest bar of any agency in London. And it was free booze every night till nine o'clock and you could bring your mates in from elsewhere. And so it was live. And it turned into a disaster. It was, how, it how, was how absolutely bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but yeah, I, I learned a heck of a lot during that time. What hmm. did you learn then that you think helps you in, in being CEO today? I learned how not to pitch when I was at, at Grey. And how, I remember how do you pitch? I was sat on a, we were pitching for Wrangler Jeans. And in our team, there was me, Johnny Shaw, uh, two other guys, um, who I won't name because it'll be <laughs> it's like I'm dishing them in. But um, all of us had worked on Levi's for a long time. All of us had made brilliant work on Levi's. So we were like, this should be a shoe in. This should be a shoe in for Wrangler. And they came in for the chemistry meeting. And honestly, I just sat there and I, I, was, I was sort of just listening to us. We spent so much time talking about ourselves and how our model of advertising was going to break the mould and how different we were and how good we were. And I was like, we just didn't talk to them. We didn't ask them any questions. It was all about us. Mm -hmm. And it was a masterclass in how not to pitch, how not to do a chemistry meeting. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the most valuable. We obviously didn't get through. It's one of the most valuable lessons I learned ever. Um, for, and what should you do then? Well, ask, ask, be interested, you know, ask a lot of questions. You know nothing about a client's business till you, till you meet them. That's mm. the same actually on Lucky Voice. Because when we pitched, we, we ran a pitch back then about for the design and the logo. And we went to all these design companies and we had them, we had all these people telling me and Johnny what our brand was about. I and mean, it was just mm. like, it gets your back up. You know, you don't know anything. Mm. I mean, you know, you, 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 you want the people who ask questions. I think it's really important to remember when you meet people, when you meet potential 
employers or potential clients to go in again with your ears open, with a learning mindset, ask questions, ask, mm. ask probing questions, have difficult, have a point of view, but ask questions. I think there's a great contrast there in your story, right? So you, obviously you guys have worked on Levi's, you know, got thinking you got it and you go in there and, and it doesn't work. Oh, it's bad. But there's a, so Matt Bushby, who's Just Eats marketing director, mm. he tells us a story on the show where he joined a dating organization and he came in to take over the digital of this organization he knew nothing about digital but he was told that the lady going on maternity leave would spend the next three months teaching him about digital cool four days later he gets a call she's had the baby you're on your own (laughs) and he's got a meeting with the head of digital for the guardian which is a big partner of theirs and he's going to this meeting going i know nothing about uh, digital i don't know anything about our partnership how I'm going to make this work. And he just went in and asked loads of yes. questions. <laughs> yes. Really inquisitive. And he said it went great. She loved it. And they had a great partnership. Absolutely. And it all went well. Absolutely. Mm. I think, you know, it, it's undervalued asking questions. It's, a, it's the most important thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Got two ears and one mouth. For Absolutely. A reason, right? Absolutely. So what happens next in your career? So yeah, the great, the great adventure came to an end, went to TWA which was also short-lived. So I, I went in there and I was, I was hired by a guy called Jonathan Mildenhall, who was joint MD at the time. And he got me in. And he very quickly after I arrived got the boot, oh. which didn't work out badly for him because he went on to be global CMO of Coca-Cola nice. and Airbnb and an you know, absolute superstar. He's a rock star of the industry now. Um, and not long after he got the boot, so did I. So oh. I, I got the boot at Why? TWA after a year. Well, the, M, the MD who remained in post, he, caught, he said to me, um, we, we actually want a pitch, we want a pitch for Panasonic. And I sent an email around about it, and he, and he wasn't happy that I'd done that for some reason. So I went up to his office, and it, yeah, it wasn't an argument as such, but he said, You've got more interest in your own. He didn't like the karaoke thing I was doing. So he goes, you've got more interest in your own business than your client's business. And he considered it to be a massive distraction, which I disagreed with. And he was like, yeah, why don't you basically go and run that? I think his line was, clients want unconventional advertising, not unconventional account handling. Which, again, I would challenge that too. But anyway. So what's your advice? If somebody has a... Uh, a business they're running and they're in employment or they'd like to start one how do you do that in a healthy way that works for everyone? well i mean it's interesting now there was a question in in our trade magazine recently campaign exactly on this on side hustles and the response i'd give you is what i gave them you know i got fired for having a side hustle 15 16 years ago now it's gone the other way now if you don't have a side hustle going on it's like you're not a complete person <laughs> well, i think both of those are a bit wrong mm-hmm. i think Having interests outside of your day job is, is a very good thing to have for your own mental well-being, for yeah. your general well-being. And it's good for your job because it means you bring in perspectives that you learn outside. It can be a good outlet. However, it, it can lead to burnout. So trying to do your day job and something else can be a bit much. So, you know, maybe he had something in, maybe, maybe there's some element of truth to him what he said but I still disagree I, I think interesting people like to do interesting things a lot of the time and that, that often can be outside of work but I think today people got a far more healthy attitude to flexible working now yeah so you get fired yes how are you making money I it was such a shock to my system I've got to say the because quite you know it's one thing telling the tale now when it turned out right but at the time it's it's a massive jolt to you you feel shock you feel a bit embarrassed, you have fear, you're like, how am I going to pay my rent? I'm going to feed myself. So all these things come crushing in really quickly. You have that sort of you know, that grief curve you go through. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it was a massive jolt. How did you feel? Um, I mean, I, I guess I was so annoyed and considered him to be so short-sighted that I, I was pretty good at using that and like channeling that into determination to one, make lucky voice work and two, to just 
prove him wrong, you know, and, mm. and, and kick on. So, I mean, luckily we were funded by then, so I could take salary from Lucky Voice mm, for yeah. a while. Um, but not, not as much as I was earning. Mm. It's up a business, there's no spare money in the business. Do you have a family at this point? Are you an agency or brand that would like to work with our production company, Unity and Motion? If so, contact us at unityandmotion.com. We produce commercials and social content for brands such as Chanel, Amazon, Reebok, Harrods, The Ritz, and many more. Now back to the show. No, I, I lived with my girlfriend at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I just sort of took the knock, really. And I just had complete belief in the concepts that we were launching. Yeah, because we were just at launch then. So I spent the first six months when we opened basically as the meter and greeter at Lucky Voice. When people came in, I'd take them into the room, sing the first couple of songs with them, then leave them to it, like, you know, the room fluffer. Nice. Mm. It was great fun. It was great fun. But after six months, you get a bit bored because, you know, you, it's really becomes a property business. You, you've, you've come up with the idea, you've come up with the concept, you've got it working, you've got the customer experience right. Then it's just about scaling that. And yeah. I, I really still enjoyed the creative process, the strategic process. Mm -hmm. So I get a call back from Gray, from Chris Hurst. I can remember I was in the back of a taxi and he called me and he was like, Dougie, here's a call I never thought I'd make, but we want you back. Okay. Because- mm. um, Why do you think it was a call we didn't- Well, that's, that's literally what he said. <laughs> um, and Gray had just won the Man Manchester City Football Club account. Mm. And they needed someone to, they didn't have anyone in the agency, uh, senior level as a suit, who knew enough about football, especially about Man City. I see, and so you I, were a Man City fan. I'm an yeah. avid Man City fan. So mm -hmm. I did a day a week back at Grey doing Man City ads. And that was the point I made earlier. So at this point, I'm doing four days a week, lucky voice, one day a week, Man City right. ads, which should be my dream. That, yeah. that, is, that is sort of my absolute life. But actually that wasn't that good because I like to go for a sing after work. Mm. Or I like to, you know, the, I remember the moment when my phone went and it came up with Man City and my heart sank. And I was like going, that's wrong. That's the wrong way around. So I think you've got to be wary about doing what you love too much. Sometimes yeah. it's good to have some distance from your job. Yeah. So you can then go to the match or go for a sing. Mm. So not, so one day became two, became three, became four. And I went back into grey. And I think for me, it massively changed my career having stepped out of the industry because it's like I chose it all over again. The reasons I did that, when I went back in to do my one day a week, I realized the privilege we have in this industry. We sit around and debate ideas. That's, that's so lucky to be able to do that. We think about what makes people tick. We think about how to change attitudes and behavior whether it's to get them to buy something or get them to start doing something or stop doing something, start with a blank piece of paper. I went back in and I was like, this is an amazing job. They want an amazing industry. So it really powered me up. Mm. So I think if I hadn't had the time out, if I hadn't got the boot, perhaps I wouldn't have had that. I just kept going plodding along mm. a bit. Okay. Whereas instead I came back in and I was so much more intentional. It was a bit like the kick up the arse I had from Lawson on my pay review. So I came back in a bit of a force, really. So I got really into my day job in the agency, and I started to do far more across the industry because I was, I was really buying into it, you know. I, and I, I, was, I really appreciated it and, and valued it. So this, this is the moment, really, that sparked your interest in being part of the yes. solutions for the industry, and you've gone on to, as I Absolutely. said, be part of Meta Council, IPA president, yes. and many things. At this, at this time is when I started doing a lot of the, at the IPA. Okay. So, the, the, so that's the Trade Body Institute of Practitioners of Advertising. And you, you normally go along to that to some training courses at the start of your career. But I guess I, I had been along once before, but I really engaged now. At the time, they used to have an ethnic diversity group, which was to look at the really low levels of representation of people from different ethnic backgrounds in advertising. So I got, I got much more involved in that side of it. Um, and around talent in general in the IPA. And you had an experience with that, with your, with your first yes, role at yes, Grey. Tell yes, us about I had. That. So on that one, I was 
we were selling in a major new campaign across the whole of EMEA um, for Mars, for their core brand. It was a mm. big deal. And we sold in this campaign and the script. And it was quite jaw-dropping for me. The, we, we sold it in and the global CMO said, yeah, I buy it, but you need to change the casting of the lead character. We had a black male as the lead, which was actually core to the script. And I... I was just blown away that a responsible advertiser would take that approach. And when pushed, she was like, well, it won't play out so well in some of our markets. How were they pushed? Well, I was like, why aren't you, how can you possibly be saying we cannot have a black person in the ad? Mm. Um, what was the response? The response was it won't play out so well in Germany, in Italy. Our consumers won't like it. And, and what did you say to that? Well, I refused to work on the business. Did you say that there and then the meeting? No, so I went I went out to chat with the, chief exec about it mm -hmm. and because i'd obviously had strong points of view on it i'd somehow studied at university institutional racism so you give the chief exec a call or how does it yeah, i went up to his through? office and i think he was like bloody hell but fair play to him he, he, he was he was there were many things he didn't do right but he was good on this one so is that there and then at the you have this meeting mm. and you go straight yeah i went to and saw, it, saw him and and he, he you know he wasn't seeing that one coming he wasn't in the meeting um, what did you say to him? I was like, we, they're, they're too big an advertiser to not behave responsibly. You know, mm -hmm. this, this is, I consider that to be, you know, a denigration of their duty as a responsible advertiser to be doing that. Now, I didn't push it to the point of saying, let's resign the account, because then you're looking at about 60 people's jobs. But How much were they paying, I, do you I, think? I would have said that was a multi-market account, so, you know, it's going to be a seven-figure sum. Um, but I, he, he totally backed me and, you know, we, we did push back on it, um, but we didn't make the ad. Um, and I refused to work on that account ever since. Mm -hmm. So and that's, that's, you know, it's, it's a pretty frequent story that you'll hear that. It's, and it, interesting, you know, you'll hear it today, especially once you go internationally. That continues yeah. internationally a lot. Um, and in some places, that's just the way it is. But here, things are improving. So if, if, if I'm someone who's in a meeting and something like that happens, what's your advice to them? How do you deal with that? I mean, it's, it's going to depend. I mean, the, the most important thing you can do is attempt to stay calm because you can feel... Because an, anybody can feel offended by that. You don't have to be a person of colour to be offended with that incident going on. Um, well, I think the... the the first one to do would be to stay calm. I think there's there's now enough support networks either within your own organization and your line manager with your, your agency leader or there's industry bodies. There's the IPA, there's ISBAR, which is the Advertiser Equivalent Institute of British Advertisers. There's BRIM, Black Representation in Marketing. I think, I think the UK is massively accelerating understanding and awareness um around diversion and inclusion diversity and inclusion i think you know the, the way i put it is 20 years ago there was no discussion 10 years ago the case would be made you know harvard business review mckinsey would be having the case the economic case for diversity diversity pays off today nobody's even making the case anymore everyone knows it to be true but there's just still a massive need to drive acceleration you know we're speaking in may it's two years since George Floyd murder. That's what started uh, black reputation in marketing. Was going the we're on the right path, but progress has been glacial. So we really need to accelerate along this. We need to move things forward. And I, you know, as I say, I remain optimistic. I can see evidence, especially in front of the camera, huge changes. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's no way I think I'd be having that conversation with Mars today. There's a bigger job, and the stats bear that out. There's a much bigger job to be done on representation behind the lens. Mm. So the people who were in the marketing team at the advertiser, in the agency team, in the creative department in agencies, um, the, the production team who were making, making the ads or, or, or whatever it might be, building the tech. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but it's come a long way. So we get to about 2008 now. Yeah, it must be something like that. <laughs> and that do you get a... a a call from VCCP Yes, saying, I did, actually. I did get a call. So I'd, I'd had a brilliant time at Grey second time round. I'd 
travel the world on Nokia, which was still a thing, opening stores in far-flung places like Hong Kong and Mexico City. It was amazing. New York, Chicago. Um, yeah, I got a phone call from VCCP. Who asked, called you? It was Ian Priest, the P of VCCP, who I'd never President. met. You know, he, he's, he, he was, he, he was uh, the chief exec at the time. Okay. And he phoned me up ask, asking me to come in for an interview to be head of O2, which was their founding account, the telecoms provider. Mm. How did you feel when you got the call? I was well excited. You know, it's, it's always nice to be, to be asked. The thing that I really liked about it is they phoned me up and they, he called me Dougie. When I went for the interview, they called me Dougie. So I knew that they must know me, or must know of me rather than, mm. you know, the, They'd seen my CV or LinkedIn mm. wasn't really a thing back then, but you know. How did they know you? Well, I didn't know this at the time, but it turns out the head of TV who worked there at the time, Bradley, I'd worked with at BBH mm. and he'd recommended me for the role. Another example of how, you know, from mm. the beginning of your career to wherever totally, you are now, totally. every day well, you're... I tell you what, even more than that, it then transpired that the wife of the MD at the time Michael Sugden, and I didn't know that till I joined, his wife, I'd been at, she was my account manager when I was account director at BBH. So oh, I, I hadn't even put that together because she had a different surname at the time. I see. So it, it really does show it's a small industry. Yeah. Mm, you know, so what you do on the way up can massively have an impact. So you come in to make an impact on, mm. on the O2 account. Yes. What do you do? Well, O2 at that time, so there's about six years into it, because um, if, if there's a founding account at VCCP in 2002, I joined six years in, it was already, we had won two IPA um, effectiveness awards, Gold and Grand Prix, so it was an incredibly effective mm. uh, account. But what does that mean to be effective? So the marketing, the communications that was being done for O2 was disproportionately effective. So, you know, a massive return on investment for every pound spent. It was really really working making money for it was absolutely company. making money and it was driving the growth of that company exponentially faster than the competition taking share off um its competitors other brands that were out there vodafone three and it came out of nowhere and overtook them all and became the biggest uh mobile provider in the uk and marketing had a huge role in that and vccp had a huge role in the market of o2 so when you joined had it had that Yes. rate of progress so it, yes. it became the market leader yes when you joined so when i joined it was it was that but from a so there was a need to maintain that momentum for o2 but as an agency vccp was known as a create a, a very effective agency but not a particularly famous for its creativity mm. and i remember that was in my interview and i was i was like you know with the people that were in the building the talent that was in the building is like it should be as famous for its creativity as well as it w just having work that works. And so I joined, a few others joined, Darren Bales joined as ECD, creative director. And the real focus for us as, as a business was to make more famous work. And that was actually exactly the time that we launched Compare the Market or Compare the Meerkat. Okay. Which was exactly at that time, going, how can we make, make work that stands out, that doesn't just work, but work that's famous that people talk about? Well, you certainly achieved that. So, yes, so compare, compare the Meerkat, which has run ever since. I mean, loads of people yeah. thought that was going to be a six-month campaign. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it continues to this day. It was a phenomenally effective uh, uh, campaign. So Enjoying Compare the campaign. Market became the fourth most visited insurance website in the UK as a result of yes, it, the work VCCP it, did. It, 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 from a basically a standing start. The story is quite interesting on Compare the Market, the, that the all... all Price comparison websites are pretty much the same. There's no discernible difference. You know, they're sort of, you know, you can't touch them. You don't mm. visit them in, in person. They're just search sites. So, you know, we tasked ourselves with giving it a personality, making it stand out. <laughs> and to try and find the way to do that, one of, the, one of the interesting things was the cost of your search term, extremely high, of compare car insurance costs you a lot. Mm -hmm. But the word to rank highly on to Google rank highly on your Google search, mm -hmm. but Meerkat so that's like five pounds. Meerkat was no one was searching for Meerkat, so that yeah. was like five p. <laughs> no one was searching it for it then. Then yeah. so so basically flipping it round with that, what people thought was a pun, but it's been extremely enduring, was extremely cost effective way. 
because the, you know their search spend could be really low and they got vast, vast, vast yeah. traffic. Because people a, were searching for compared to so meerkat. People just had yeah. meerkat. Yeah, it's a very smart strategy. So it was a very it. smart way in mm. and obviously executed brilliantly. And I had nothing to do with it, so I can't take the can't take the straps on that one. But talking about effectiveness, in 2010, the website was receiving more than two million hits per month. Yes. Yes. It was and phenomenal. the site's overall sales doubled. I mean, it's they. It was phenomenal commercial uh, effect uh, story for compare the market as a business, but culture is a cultural phenomenon. So you know, Alexander Orlov, the meerkat, his autobiography outsold Tony Blair's autobiography. <laughs> you know, this is a real book. Was, you can was, buy it in it the bookstore. Absolutely. For this, CGI my, my sister character. bought me the book for Christmas, not knowing that my agency <laughs> wrote the book. <laughs> It was a cultural phenomenon, you know. I think at the time, Alexander had more followers on. It's like the birth of Twitter, wasn't it? Alexander had more followers on Twitter than like Cheryl Cole and people like that. It was it was crazy. <laughs> wow, and, and still uh, it still is. It's it's phenomenal. Mm. Alexander even started a petition to add the word "simples" to the dictionary. It's in the dictionary. It is in, it the, is, dictionary. Is in the dictionary. <laughs> and the other other one of the other stats you used to every time you took out a policy, you'd get a a toy, a little uh, meerkat, a little. Yeah, Poppy. yeah, I, I and, was sent um, one of those actually. And well, compare the market became the after McDonald's Happy Meals, the biggest toy distributor in the whole of the UK because they were shifting that many policies off the back of it. Wow. So that is a phenomenal. It's a great demonstration of the power of creativity. Mm. Mm. That's effective advertising, right Absolutely. there. Absolutely, but it's effective and creatively powerful, mm. which is what you need as an agency. It's not just enough to do work that works. You need to do work that people are really proud of because that's how you get your talent in because mm. agencies are fundamentally we're about people we're about talent so what so about o2 which was mm. your account yes. what you were brought in to thrive yes what did you do how did you make the impact that you wanted to well it was i mean the o, o2 is as as a company has continued to grow and grow it's got you know well now it's uh, combined with virgin media but back then it had, you know, 16, 17, 20, 24 million customers. So everything that you're doing when you work with a company like that is trying to understand your audience, understand their life, everything about them. What's, what, where are the positive moments? Where are the negative moments? Where, where can you as a brand add value to their lives? Whether it's sometimes it can be fun, entertainment. Sometimes it can be removing a pain point. Mm. But as a brand that's of that scale... It's almost a quarter of the country. Or it's, it's, exactly, like it's fast. It's mm. fast, so you really need to really interrogate and understand your audience, what they care about, and then find the, the role that you can have that can help to improve their lives. Mm. Yeah. How did you do that? So a good example would be Priority. So Priority was a scheme that looked at People people like to spend time with music, with entertainment. So with priority, we'll add, we we gave you know that whole thing that used to happen when your mates would get to a gig and you wanted to go, but the tickets were gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just be, allowing you to buy tickets before anybody else it was extremely valuable. You know, a little insight like that drove value for the individual because you could get to go and see gigs at the O2 that other people couldn't get if they weren't on the network. But it drove huge commercial gains for O2 itself. Because then lots of people would switch from Vodafone going, well, I want to be on ATs and get the tickets. Yeah. And then, you, you, you know, you constantly, I think there's a need to have constant renewal, keep looking for new opportunities to then extend that proposition. So that could be money off, it could be free coffees, it could be access to all sorts of different things, whether it's mm -hmm. sport or entertainment. So you're obviously impressed with the work on O2 and you start to rise up the company. What was your next role? So I started to... Well, I started doing lots of new business. I, 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 enjoy, I enjoy good pitches. So that by good pitches, I mean necessary, respectful pitches. Mm, not um, just talking at the client. Mm. Like well, but also a lot of pitches happen when you don't need a pitch, which is something I'm doing at the IPA at the moment, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But, um, yeah, I, I did a lot of new business at VCCP, so I, I won. So when, when an, an, an advertiser decides to move their advertising account they often go and meet a bunch of agencies mm -hmm. and then they go with the one that they think best suits them and so yeah i did a lot of new business mm -hmm. so one won quite a few big accounts which helped to advance my career gray matters new business tip for today 
Do more listening than talking. Make sure prospects are talking for 70% of the time with you asking intelligent and thought-provoking questions. If you ever find yourself doing most of the talking, then something is not right. Plan the flow of a meeting and make sure you get what you need out of it. Grey Matters is a straight-talking business development consultancy that empowers agencies to position, market and sell themselves for new business success. I see. So you get promoted to deputy MD? Yeah, I went deputy MD, then I became vice chairman. And yeah, we, we're a good pitching agency at VCCP. And I, I won a lot of big pitches. So tell us about that. You, you, your company is known for being great at new business. Yes. 2020 alone, you won 60 new clients. I mean, that would be internationally, yes, we did. Wow. Internationally. But I think in the last 11 years in the UK, we've been top of the new business table 10 years. Question yeah, only one, one year we didn't get it, we were second. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. What, how? What, what is it that you do at VCCP that allows you to be so good at new business? For, for any business owner listening, Yes. what are the lessons? Um, the reasons why we're so good at new biz, there's a, I don't know, there's a few. Is it one, taking them to karaoke? Is that the we, secret? We, <laughs> we've got a good new business team, first of all. We've got a really smart, switched on, intelligent and extremely energetic people who work in a new biz team who are constantly either responding to inbound requests because people will get in touch and go, are you the guys who do compare the market? Are you the guys who do easy chat? Are you the guys who do O2? Or they'll sniff out interesting opportunities. So they've got an ear to the ground, know where businesses are moving, what accounts are up for grabs. And so that, fir that, that first contact department, which is called your new business department, is absolutely crucial. You, you will not do well without that. What's the structure of your new business department? There's about eight of them in the UK office who are making sure that we're, we've just got an ear to the ground, that we're speaking to intermediaries who often like the date, you know, like, like uh, the dating companies of the <laughs> advertising industry that are just, you know, reading the press, reading, reading the news, knowing what's, What's how, moving around? How do you how do you get yourself? You said you know they're they're got their ear to the ground. They're in the right places. How do you do that? Well, I mean, in, with modern technology, it's not that difficult really because you can just set a load of Google alerts on your phone. You can get lots of inbound, but you 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 have to have a genuine interest in the industry and how business moves. Because then you'll find that you're on the right sites. You're reading stuff, but you know you could you could do your new business just by reading the FT. You, you can probably why have you it. say that because if you see there's a big merger, if you can see a company's been bought, if you can see that the chief exec's left, mm. you know there's quite. If you can see a company that's struggling, you know, that share price is collapsing. If you can see a place that's just come out of nowhere, that's just emerging. You know, if you look at today's environment, there's lots of new uh, tech brands that have hit that point where they've gone direct to consumer, but they're starting to plateau. Yeah. where the role of brand's going to become more important to them because they can't, there's product parity. You, know, you, you can see all these signs for when people might be looking for some fresh advice on their marketing. Mm. There's, a, there's a quote you shared in your address to the industry from Einstein. Mm. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Absolutely. So that's what you're, you're saying people should look for is Absolutely. It's FT or other other you know, news outlets. Yes. Where are the companies that are having difficulty or change? Absolutely. You, you go, where, where are, well, what you're looking for is where can we add value mm, really? Yeah. So the points I can add value, or my company can add value will often be, or where you're most receptive to hearing ideas that can add value might be when things are going really bad or when things are going really good. Yeah. It's almost the slow, steady ones in the middle. That's that un, unlikely to be um, willing to change. So you're now CEO. What are the first things you did when you got into this role? Well, for me, for, for the company to succeed, there's three things that you need to think about. The first one, it's all about talent. It's all about people. Mm. We need to be the choice of the best talent in our market. Mm. And, you know, we're operating internationally now. Yeah. So the first one you've got to go is why, why would the best talent in the world want to work at this company? Mm. so you've got to have a really clear proposition that you're offering you've got to stand for something you have a point of view mm. you've got to be showing your 
credentials and your capabilities and you've got to have a culture you know a belief system that mm. gives you a chance to get the best people in get to attract people but once you get the best talent you've then got to create an environment that they want to stay in where yeah. they can excel where they can thrive mm. so the biggest the first part of my job as international chief exec is to ensure we're a place that is a choice of the best talent mm -hmm. the second part is about the clients we we need to be the choice of the best clients because mm. you want clients who are going to commit to doing good work, work that's effective, but work that's creative, work that will attract other people who go, I want to work at a place that does work like that. Or yeah. clients who go, I want a bit of that. So again, you've got to create an environment where clients have a good experience, where you build trust and you can demonstrate your, you know, the effectiveness of the work that you're making. Yeah. And then the third part to my job internationally is to be the choice of the best entrepreneurs so you know the, the quickest way to accelerate our growth often is to buy other companies yeah. but again you've got to ask the question why why would a, a company want to be bought by us versus somebody else and again that's that's showing that we have a clear identity we have a point of view that we have complementary skills mm -hmm. that people coming into this organization at a senior level can really thrive and develop mm -hmm. so i guess th those are the things that I focus on in like three buckets, but really they're all about people, it's about understanding people. Fantastic. Do you, what do you look for when you're thinking about buying a company? What are you looking at to make you feel like, yes, this is the company? Please? I would say the, the first part is you've got to understand your own gaps. So you need to know, you need to do like a full ongoing audit of your own capabilities to go, where are we, where are we missing something? Where, where have we got a gap? So then you know what you're looking for. Any examples of, of how that's been at ECCP? Well, I mean, to be honest, as we're growing internationally, we're still a, we're a big company in the UK, but we're a small company internationally. You know, so we're, we're third in market by billings in the UK internationally. We're tiny. We're 1,400 people. So we've got lots of gaps. 1,400 people across, across eight offices. Eight offices in the market. So we've got lots of capability gaps outside of the UK where we need more uh, CX talent, more creative talent. We've got some brilliant people, but we need to, we're in a scaling up phase. Um, so you need to go, where, where do we best need to infill? Then the second thing is absolutely crucial is you need a cultural fit. You know, any course will tell you most acquisitions fail. And the reason for failure is often cultural fit. It just doesn't yeah. work. It doesn't come together. And in a, in a smaller, smaller company like we are, it's absolutely crucial to get that right. So when you get it right, there should be a multiplier effect for both businesses. Mm. But it's, it's worth spending the time to get that fit right. And for you as VCP with the culture you've got, what are you looking in there for in their culture? So we're a company, we call ourselves a challenger agency. So we're filled with people who, no matter what discipline they are or what country they're in, they ask a lot of questions, they're curious. We poke things with sticks all the time and lift up stones and see what's under it and find different ways of doing things. You know, inquisitive people that can be quite demanding and a bit of a pain in the ass, but who like trying stuff out. So that's, that's the sort of people we are. So we, you need to find your natural bedfellows. You need people who are, who are the same, who aren't happy just sticking with the status quo or the safe choice, who like to push things on. And then you, you know, if that goes well, you get them in. This is whether you're hiring them or, or, or make an acquisition and give them the opportunity to do exactly that. I think of, often you see companies make acquisitions or hire people and then somehow expect them to not be who they hired. Whereas for us, you know, you want to get people with a challenger mindset in and then give them the space to go challenge. Because the only way for us to stay fresh as well as getting new talent in, who question how we do things. Yeah. If you think I've been at my company 14 years. That's a long time. I need people at all levels, whether it's brand new first day in the job or 20 years in to come in and question our practices, our assumptions. You need that to have the constant renewal for a creative company. So as a CEO, what impact and what do you do as a CEO that you think is critical for the business to succeed? So others who may be running a business yes. or would like to can learn from your best practices and, and how you do it? When I'm doing my job well, it's about giving one a clear, a clear vision, a clear plan for where the company's going, 
And two, getting out of the way and letting, you know, giving the support for people to get on with the jobs. So I look after our seven offices outside the UK. Now, on that span... How is that? That's, you've got that, seven offices around the world you've got to manage. How do you well, do all that? Well, it, in, it's in, you, you have to be uh, confident and relaxed at allowing people to get on with their job. Because otherwise, you, if you try and micromanage around seven offices around the world, then you're nev- literally never going to sleep because the sun never sets <laughs> in a day. So, you know, I'm, we've, we've recruited well. We've got great leads in each of our offices. I speak to them loads. I speak to them every week. Is there a structure to that? How do you macromanage then seven offices? Well, everything's um, changed a lot with lockdown in the last two years. Yeah. So... I mean, the way that I personally do at VCP is I speak to all our office leads every Tuesday. So Tuesday's a lot of Zoom calls for me. From Sydney in the morning through Singapore, Shanghai, Madrid, Prague, New York, San Francisco. What I, time does the first meeting start? I do half eight, first one, um, half five, six o'clock, the last one. Okay. Mm. And so how long are they? Half an hour each. And how, what's the agenda? How is it structured? It's pretty loose it's a conversation but it'd basically be people product profit okay in each one going what's going on in your business what how's the work you know how, how how's the people going how's the work how's the output what are the numbers like pretty loosely i see but i'd go that's a pretty loose that'd be my cadence and i guess now we're able to travel again recently i got everybody together which was really good because mm. we've put on about 300 people during lockdown so that's lots of people who've never physically met each other. So we had a big get together. Get together in terms of which offices? We brought the leadership team from every office into London, okay. just to be together. Yes. Then you want then then everyone goes back, and then you know you sort of top up over time. But I'm I'm looking forward to getting back out to those offices. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to ask before. So prior to lockdown, were you travelling around quite a lot? Yes, I was travelling loads. Because we opened in Singapore, so I was out there. We opened in Shanghai, so I was out there a lot. As things have opened up, there's some travel is necessary, but I think now that everyone's so good at remote working and using technology, there's far more cohesion across the network than there was before because everybody's more used to it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's still important to get people together face-to-face, especially for p- people who are new to a company, to really build those relationships that you can then maintain online, you do need to meet at some point. So what else do you do as a CEO? Well, that's do you quite think a lot. critical? That keeps me pretty busy, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, are there uh, any core like things you like? Yes, you, you start to explain. Yeah. These are the things that when I'm doing good as a CEO, I'm yes. doing. I don't know. The, the most important thing for me as a CEO, and I guess everyone does it differently, but for me, it's, it's contact time with people in my organisation. It's not really about me disappearing off and coming up with grand plans. There's nothing that can be achieved in an ad agency without people doing it. So it's, it's more about making sure everybody is extremely well connected. Communication of plans, targets, performance is really quick that everybody knows what's going on, making, making sure that we have that consistency of the culture, of the quality, focus on our clients and our output. Um, it's constantly checking in with people and being available for people because at any, any moment there'll be a problem somewhere. You know, there's just going to be, once you get to a certain scale, there's always things going on. Um, so you need to be able to jump into action there and lend support as required. Great. Yeah, so you meant you mentioned to us on our first call around how if you have a barrier, you'll always use your resources, learn new skills, learn new tools to get over that barrier. And part of part of your story is that you got an MBA. Yes. Tell us a bit about why you did that and what it gave you. I found myself at a social function with the founder of my company and a couple of extremely senior clients. So the chief exec of O2, chief exec of Car- uh, Carphone Warehouse and the founder of Carphone Warehouse for an extended period of time. And so I felt during the 
the event with them that I was under-equipped to be really contributing to the conversation throughout. There were certain bits I absolutely knew my stuff. So when we talked about advertising and the impact of the work we did on O2, I knew that. Mm-hmm. When we talked about football, I could ace that. Anything into karaoke space, you know, I was the authority in the room. But I, in, when he got into commercials or just what was going on beyond that in the running of business, this is going back about 10 years now, I felt underpowered. Mm. I felt underpowered and I didn't like it because I, for my, and it, it was just for my own self. I just felt, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, the only word I can use, I'm not well equipped enough here. I felt, yeah. I felt like I needed more tools. Mm. Did it feel similar to you when you had your first pay review? Well, no, that one was different. In a way, the first pay review, yes, maybe it was the same. Because in that one, well, to be honest, I really felt injustice. <laughs> pay <laughs> review. And I, I had to, imp- I had to improve my framing I see. after mm. my first pay review. Mm-hmm. Whereas on this one, I just felt I was ill-equipped. Mm. I was like, I don't have the tools here to be getting to the level at which I want to be, to, to realise my own ambition. So I guess back to the upbringing I had, to where my success has come from, if I don't have something, if I don't know something, I'll go out and learn it. So that was why I did an exec MBA. You know, much, I was much older on the course than everybody else. Um, how old were you? How old were they? I must have been, must have been late 30s. So I had a daughter by then. I had Maya, so she was one when I did the course, and everyone else was. Pr- I think you had to be about you had to be ten or twelve years into work to do an exec MBA. So everyone else was probably about thirty, thirty-two, when I was about thirty-eight. Probably about then I did it. Um, so it was a big undertaking of time to do it because it was, it was t- two days a fortnight for two years, which is oh. quite a big, big mm-hmm. thing to sign yeah, up that to. Is quite a lot. But it was a brilliant thing to do because you, you get the payback off it while you're doing it. It's not like you don't get the payback till you finish it. You get a payback every week. And, it's, and for me, it was a good way to learn, actually, because it's like you're drip feeding the learning in. Instead of boshing it out in a year in a vacuum full time, you did it effectively every Friday over two years. And I could, I could do the studying, do the lectures, do the tasks. Mm, and time for integration. But then I, it could seep in to my brain. I could also just immediately try the stuff out. Mm. So by the time I finished and graduated the course, which I mean, I was delighted to finish it because it does take a lot of time. You're already testing things out, putting them into practice. Mm. But for me, it made a huge difference to accelerate my career because I, I felt better equipped. Mm. I had better, I had more frames of reference. I had more examples that weren't just advertising. I had better understanding of the challenges any business might face. You know, you effectively, on an MBA, you effectively sit in every, in each module, you sit in each chair around a boardroom table and look at the world through the lens of the CFO, the head of HR, the marketing director, you know, all the way around to the operations director. You, you see problems through different lenses. Now, it's a generalist course. You don't go into massive depth, but it's just enough you almost get a scaffold of understanding. Mm. And for me, I like that. I like, to, I like to know how things work. I like to know the shape of things. So it, it, it made me feel so much better equipped. And the other thing it did that was crucial is it made me understand how little most of my clients know about marketing. Because most of them did four days on a module, on MBA on marketing, and that's it. And it was amazing to me because I was the only person who did marketing or certainly the only person doing advertising on my course at Warwick Business School where I did it. And see, seeing, the, especially the CFOs, when they understood on the marketing module the impact that marketing can have to their bottom line at the cost, they were all just cock a hoop. Yeah. So again, it's much easier to change my marketing or improve my marketing than to change where I, my supply chain, my plant, you know, all these things that have huge investments. Yeah. Well, if you can get a brilliant marketing campaign, compare the market, you can transform things. You can transform your business quickly, effectively, for an enduring amount of time through marketing. So it made me really value what we do. Yeah. And that, I valued that at a VCCP level and at an IPA level, which has driven a lot of my initiatives around us getting better rewarded for the work we do. If we, if we don't appreciate the value we create, if we can't articulate the value we create, how can we expect to get paid for it? 
and that's a you know a huge part of the push behind training courses at the IPA is to better equip the people in our businesses to to make sure we get paid well because then if we get paid well we can attract and retain the best talent who can then make the the marketing that works that builds businesses mm -hmm. so there's a real symbiosis to it yeah i think there's a real task for us as agency folk to upskill to tool up mm. so we're getting on to industry now industry yes. conversation which it sounds like it was sparked from you leaving the industry yes. coming back and going okay i'm yes. fueled and motivated to be part of making this better for all of us yes you get invited to the meta council yes that's great how did that come about it's the you're a member of the uk client council for, yes for meta yes so i i don't know they just called me up and asked me to to come along it's, it's a it's a brilliant um opportunity because you get i really like cross industry platforms so a lot of the work i've done at the ipa itself is with isbar the advertisers because that's how you get change so meta council is a real privilege to be part of that because you've got some of the best brains at facebook across the different brands at meta you've got clients who are big spenders and you've got agency folk so that's a it's a great place to challenge each other to share ideas um I think we've seen that more and more. A lot of the challenges that we face in our industry, in society, are so big, you can't put a dent in them. You can't tackle them acting just as one agency or even acting just as all the agencies. You, you need to join hands. So if you're looking at, if you're looking at sustainability, you, that has to be a cross-industry push. If you're looking at d and inclusion, that has, to be cross in, that has to be across industry. That can't just be agents on their own. It's got to be, or advertisers on their own, it's got to be both. The, the one I'm currently passionate about is the agency selection process, pitching, which is, which is born out of seeing the negative impacts we're seeing on mental health in our industry. It's driving people out of our industry because people are burning out. So something I've done with my PA presidency there is to go right after that and go, well, the most acute point of pressure on people, on individuals, whether they're an agency or advertiser, often it's during the pitch process, Give me this as an example of what kind of hours are people some in some cases, in extreme cases, doing to, in a pitch? I mean, there was a reporting campaign, the Trade Press magazine last year, that had people doing, you know, 70, 80-hour weeks when they're pitching because it's extracurricular. And that's, you could do that for a short burst, but if, that's a, if that becomes the modus operandi of the industry, you're going to get negative outcomes for people. Mm -hmm. You're going to get burnout. You're going to get people leaving the industry. There's also, you're going to get work that's not as good. I think this is great because something we were told by a uh, head of department in a big agency in our Unify sessions, we were looking at what are the bigger challenges in the industry, how can we move forward? She felt that if you were to crumble under the pressure or go, this is too much, I'm burnt out, that the company would get a wheelbarrow, come along, stick you in it, roll you off and find somebody else. Dreadful. And where does she work? <laughs> <laughs> I won't say. Okay, so in 2016, you become fe a fellow of the IPA. How does your journey within the IPA then progress to you becoming the president? Well, the reason I was made a fellow was for helping, work, working with a bunch of people, brilliant people, the IPA and other agencies, and we put together a few initiatives that have really made a difference around talent. One was to tackle social mobility and the industry being too focused on London when there's such great talent right across the UK. And that was Advertising Unlocked, where every agency in the land has an open day on the same day. Then you can do a push out to young people to go and visit your local agency. Otherwise, in the old days, people got to come to London to see what an agency is like, which is crazy because lots of people wouldn't ever consider coming to London. And why should they? So advertising on lots worked really well. Then the next one we did was the I list, which was campaign magazine. The trade mag used to do the A list, the most elite, important people in advertising. And so we did the I list, which was really celebrating and showcasing the people who were going above and beyond to make it a more inclusive industry, mm -hmm. the inspirational list, if you like. And both of those have had a lot of traction, a lot of, uh, have, have, have done really well, a really good impact already. So I guess as a result of that, I was recognised as a fellow. 
and we just kept going really kept pushing kept pushing on talent and i've i don't know exactly how it happened but i yeah, just got a phone call asking me if i would, would consider being the president of the ipa and you know I, I so believe in the the power of a trade body like that to affect significant impact and change that i was absolutely delighted to to take it on what does a president of the ipa mean what do you do yeah what do you it, do it means I work with all the people who actually work at the IPA, with the Director General, Paul Bainsfer, who I know you've had here, and, and there's about 65 people work at the IPA doing everything from uh, continuous professional development, through legal advice, through commercial advice, through the training. Um, I, I help to work with them and represent what they're doing to the press, to events like this. Um, I also set an agenda to highlight an issue or issues I think we should be taking notice about and I interact with other trade bodies. So you decide to do your address. This is, you start off as, as president and you address the industry and say, this is my plan, this is what I'm going to do. And you decide to do this recorded from Manchester. Yes. Uh, tell us about your plans for the industry and, and why you decided to do that. Well, there were two reasons why I did my address from Manchester. Um, one, it was during lockdown, so this was last March. So in, in days before, everyone would go for lunch, somewhere like the Grosvenor on Park Lane in the basement, and you'd all have a nice bit of knife and fork, then you'd get wheel out the president, he'd say a few bits. That wasn't an option when I took over because it was lockdown, so everyone was stuck at home. But rather than look at that as a, as a downer, I was like, this is a great opportunity to, to break, have a break with that. Mm. and to, to get out of the basement, to get out of the M25. And so I did my address from Manchester, from the Science Museum in Manchester, because it was as much about industry and commerce as advertising. Because for me, my, my presidential agenda is uh, 10x, accelerate opportunity. And that was born of what we saw was possible during lockdown. You know, the much vaunted uh, uh, statistic was we'd seen 10 years adoption of uh, technology in people's lives in one year and it's 10 times and for me there was obviously the pandemic has been a dreadful thing on many ways but one of the rare positives it's shown what we're capable of when we need to do something be that yeah. caught with the vaccine be that the fact that my folks now use google pay when they <laughs> when they go shopping <laughs> whether that's the fact that people understand you can work from home and be just as productive if not more I think there was a, there's a moment in time, a discontinuous moment, an inflection point where we understand what we're capable of when we apply creativity, when we collaborate, when we see each other as people. And so trying to bottle some of that spirit and take it to some of the biggest challenges we face as an industry is what my agenda is all about. Hence, can we find a better way to consider the pitching process? That's a real 10x initiative because people have talked about it for years, but it's it's been the same, getting worse each year. Mm. And this is a real step change that we're trying to make of, let's just correct it, course correct. I think it's a great asset of your personality and character that you are someone who is, is about real tangible change and effectiveness. Yes. You know, whether that's in the work that you're doing or industry change. And as you said in your address, you want to shake things up. Absolutely. And, uh, and make change. And I think the, the work that's been done and is doing is, is showing that things are, material but material and tangible um to yes. make a difference which is great tell us about brim black representation brim. in marketing and the great work that's being done there. well you there. you mentioned exactly that and on uh, black representation in marketing our, our our line is from from good intentions to meaningful action so i think there's there's no lack of people who want to make a change but actually affecting that change making it happen is where we need to put the effort so that's been a, a brilliant initiative where we've gathered all the tangible steps that companies have made and we've open sourced them, whether that's about your hiring policy, you know, training, approach to production, casting briefs, um, uh, all, all the possible component parts you could get, all the companies that are part of Brim have shared what they've got. So you can you go on there for free and get this stuff down. So that was immediate, actionable, tangible. Um, where we are now is we're launching a mentoring scheme cross industry um, where we can really help to 
give people hands-on advice on how to further the career. Um, we also got a directory where you can find black talent that you can use, whether it's for production, for different parts of your fulfilling your communications. So that's a, it's a bunch of people who have all opted in to say, let's do something, let's really move this along and take that good intention, which is, which is fine, but turn it into action. Mm, love that. Love it. Brilliant. And how can people uh, find out about Brim? and, and what To find doing? out about Brim, go to the Advertising Association website and you'll find it all there. Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. So we reached this point now. Great. We want to know what's next for Julian Douglas. Well, what's next is I've got to do a Brim thing in about 45 <laughs> minutes. But um, in terms of what's next for me, I don't even really know. Um, Are there any personal goals you want yeah. to do that you haven't done yet? I would say what's next for me is, well, I'm not done yet with my 10X agenda. So we've just launched Pitch Positive. There's multiple other things that we're trying to deliver there. Um, and from a VCCP point of view, we've barely begun. You know, the, the, the people that we now have working with us around the world, the brands that we're working with, like White Claw, like Google, um, like Canon. You know, the, these are ambitious brands, ambitious people that are in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely lots, to, lots to, to do there to get excited about. On a personal level, um, I'm looking forward to hopefully City winning the league in the next week. And, um, pretty, pretty hard to mess it up from here. <laughs> it's very possible. I've supported City for 40 odd years. So let's summarise. We'd like to end the show by yes, summarising so the lessons summary. from Dougie's yes. life, Dougie's journey. Yes. I would say three things. Three th here's my three things to end on. My sort of three rules to live by. The first one is be brave. I think it's important to be ambitious and to push yourself and set goals. And that can sometimes require you to step out of your comfort zone. To, to be, you know, got to be brave to do that. Uh, the second one is be restless. Um, I think it's important to keep agitating, iterating, scratch the itch, keep, you know, it's always been curious, really. Uh, keep, keep asking questions. And the final one is really simple, is be human. Everything that we do is about other people. To achieve anything is going to be reliant on other people. And I think it's important to keep that in mind at the start of your career and all the way through it. You know, enough to chat today, it's amazing how many things I've said were reflected of someone I'd met Earlier in my career, I didn't even notice that till having this conversation today. So yeah, be be brave, be restless, be human. Fantastic, fantastic. He talks about the importance of different perspectives. We'll give you our perspective now on your life. Ash, you want to kick us off? I think you certainly an carry an element of enjoying your work and having fun with it, and that's something that's very important. I feel to mm. just enjoy it and and to to really push forwards. To, to make things that are great and to go to places that are doing great work to be a part of those mm. things. I, th I think, as you said, you saw the ad when you, you were mm. at university and then, you know, however many years later you're working on that account at that agency. I think that's testament to really focusing on what you wanted to do and following that through. Cheers, man. I think uh, from my perspective, you're a great example of how to really, yeah, affect change whether it's you're starting off in your career to to where you are now and just focusing on being really effective mm. whether that's winning new business for your company and showing them that this is a person we should take to the highest level in the company to these are the problems in the industry and i'm going to do something about it before you're a president you know oh let's open up all the agencies on the same day what a great idea and made it happen and it's a great example of you can make change in industry. You just have to, one, have the belief you can do it, have the passion to get it done and bring the right people around to make it happen. And it can, and it can happen. So I think you're a great example for other people to look at and go, yes, it's possible. Nice one. I love that. Bang on. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, I think we can, we can end it there. Yeah, thank absolutely. you. Thank you coming. very much. Yes, yeah, so enjoyed that. Us that is the story of how you became wow. chief executive of VCCP and president of the IPA. There it is. Cheers. Thanks for having me.